hey all, it's really um, it's really lovely to be here with you all. You guys are you guys are the, the you guys are either very nerdy, uh, very hardcore, uh, or very peer pressurable uh, uh, because you signed up for a lecture on pedagogy on a Thursday night. So uh, congratulations uh, if you're if you're if you're one of those three. But uh, it's really nice to be here. I, thanks for thanks for coming out and uh, um, hopefully. I'll, uh, I've titled this one, Partners in Pedagogy, Supporting Your Child's Classical Education at Home. Um, uh, but really, uh, honestly, uh, the way that it works a lot of times is the other way around, in which um, ideally, uh, you guys are the ones kind of setting a tone at home uh, with the students. And the schools actually, our job is to, is to be in loco parentis, in, in, uh, to do some, to, 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 to resonate with the tone that you guys set. Uh, at home um, in, uh, during the day, and so um, I, either way, uh, you know, whatever direction way you want to think about it, one of the one of the goals I think is to is to merge some of the things that happen during the school day and some of the things that happen on the home front um, into something that's uh, that's together, that's united, it's kind of a united front. And I think students are going to respond much better. Uh, students slash, ch I'm going to call them students all night, but but. Children, are gonna, your children are going to respond much better to things that are in line, right? Uh, the, thi that, the things that they're hearing over the dinner table, the things that they're hearing, um, you know, when they wake up, when they go to bed, are the same things they're hearing from teachers um, during the day. And I think that's why you send, you pick a school, uh, is that it's in line with the things that you value for your children. Um, and so I think this is a really important time that we can come together. Um, and I can say some of the things that I said to the teachers today. Uh, to you guys, um, so that you know what the teachers are doing, uh, you know the kind of the things that are going on at school. I think sometimes school can be this black box that you send your kids to, and then they come home, and you're like, "Well, what happened during that black box?" And uh, your eighth grader is not interested in talking to you about that. Uh, so some of the things, just some transparency about the kinds of things that happen at school, um, and then um, just asking the question at the very end. Um, uh, a, a number, a, a good bit of this is going to be just good parenting. <laughs> there's nothing, there's nothing magical that I'm going to share about parenting tonight. Uh, but just trying to say, okay, if this is what's happening at the on the school front, right? What can I do? With just a few thoughts at the end about what can I do at the home on the home front uh, to bring those things a little bit in line, um, so that our students, our children, are are you know, getting the same kind of messaging the same kind of things on both sides, OK? Um, so uh, the, I pulled some of these things from some of the things I shared at the school today. Uh, so uh, some of the advice I gave the teachers, I'm going to uh, try to give a little bit, uh, share a little bit with you now. So I want you to begin by imagining a school. Um, and since I have the magic of PowerPoint, I can help you. And now you can help, now you can actually imagine said school. And we all know that a school is actually made up of two things. Yes, uh, if you think about the life of the school, it comes down to exactly two things. They're the school culture, right? This is the kind of tone that gets set, the kind of things that happen in, um, at, uh, you know, these are the, the, the virtues that the school uh, tries to embody, right? The practices that it gets into, um, these types of things. And then the curriculum, this is what gets uh, what gets taught, what gets selected, right? Uh, we know that this is true because we can look at the mission statement, uh, or the, uh, maybe not this isn't the mission statement, but uh, the thing that I pulled from the website explaining what Catholic classical education is, it's two things, yes? Um, it's a uh, tried and true method of learning, proven form of education that integrates all subjects. It's curricular, right? Your curricular bells are ringing here, right? Focuses on developing the mind and the soul. It's cultural, right? Growing in wisdom and virtue, again, cultural. Um, this idea of discipleship, faith, um, these are all kind of school culture type things. And it's achieved by emphasizing the trivium. This is grammar, logic, rhetoric, again, curricular piece. Um, and uh, as well as Latin, math, science, and the fine arts. This is what we study here, right? And so what you can see here is we have two actual veins in which we want to think of a school or we want to imagine a school, right? Uh, that we want to work with our students. And the way you partner with these kinds of things is you try to do similar things at the, on, on the home front here, right? So if the culture of the school is based on faith, is based on wisdom and virtue, mind and soul, sort of civic responsibility, um, and the curriculum here is based on great texts, it's based on the trivium, uh, quadrivium, if you will, uh, math and science, um, Latin, 
um, and integration across those subjects, as well as the fine arts, right? Uh, actually partnering with the with your students on the or with your children on the home front is actually decently makes some sense, right? You want to put good things in front of them, curriculum, right? Uh, you want to make sure they have good books to read, that they're not burning away their time on video game. I mean, like all you want to have good things in front of them. They want to have uh, spend their time with the great text, spend their time with books and with um, relationships and these types of things uh, on, the, on the curriculum side. And you want to make sure they're doing it in, um, you know, you want to make sure that they are, have some sort of good home culture, right? Uh, where there's emphasis on faith um, and discipleship um, and virtue and responsibility. And so I think this is really the key to, um, this is really the key to partnering with your school um, is just like your school is going to put good things in front of your students and create a culture in which good virtues are encouraged. It's the exact same thing that needs to happen at home. Right? So um, thank you guys a lot for coming out. I really appreciate um, Do you have any questions? Oh, yeah. OK. So uh, yeah, there's that third piece of the school, right? Where a school is actually, none of what I said is false, by the way, right? But, uh, but it's definitely not the whole story here about what a school is like. There's actually this third piece of school life. Uh, it's called pedagogy. And uh, it's not one you often talk about, hear about, think about, right? Um, I think. Uh, so, I mean, imagine this, right? Uh, you are where you are. I don't know where you guys hang out. Uh, uh, I was told there was some sort of popular establishment to hang out, but I don't. I imagine you guys are at the park. Uh, imagine you guys are at the park. You're pushing your kid on the swings. I don't know, maybe you have a high schooler, so this is a weird image for you. But, but you're pushing your kid on the swings, right? And there's someone else next to you, right? And they're pushing their kids on the swings, and you're pushing the kids, and you get in a conversation. And you know where are you sending your kid to school, right? Uh, well, he goes to Saint Ignatius. You go uh, and um, I'm like, oh yeah, what kind of school is that? Well, it's a it's a it's a classical school, right? And then they say, well, what's a classical school? Uh, is it like you know Amish school? I'm sure you get this question. I don't know whether you get this question or not, but you're like, well, what's a what's a classical school, right? Um, and think of the answers that we often give. What are some of the ways in which you talk about a classical school? Right? Um, sometimes we give a curricular answer. Right? It's a great book school. It's a liberal arts school. It's a, it believes in fine arts. Right? Um, great texts, this kind of thing. We give a curricular answer. That's an easier answer to give. Right? Or we give a cultural answer. Right? Uh, it's a school that emphasizes faith and virtue, discipleship. They wear uniforms. Right. These types of answers are the common answers that we give for describing a classical school. Right? Um, very rare to actually give the answer of, oh, they have some sort of a distinctive pedagogy. Right? They have some, right, pedagogy being the methods by which you teach. Right? What you're doing in the classroom to actually make these great texts come alive and establish culture. Um, and so, if you're thinking about, I think it's a question that we actually don't, um, we don't have a vision for, right? Uh, we don't know what it looks like to have a distinctively classical pedagogy. But I think if we truly are doing this thing with curriculum and culture, where we're, you know, we're, we claim to be this school that is interested in these great things and helping to establish, you know, we want these great things to happen, right? we should pair them with a method of making those things happen that is just as distinctive and just as great, okay? Um, and I actually think, um, I was sharing this with the teachers this morning and I was saying something like, uh, you know, I would actually rather you teach bad stuff if you're gonna employ bad pedagogy. Like, yeah. It, I, the worst thing we can do is present the great texts and the great, you know, the Bible, Shakespeare, all, all these things to students in a way that sucks the life out of them. Because now they're going to have, they're going to have lost a vision for the things that are beautiful because they haven't been, they haven't seen that beauty, right? And I, I think this, actually, actually have my own family culture in mind. Um, uh, 
and 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 a few students of mine just like uh, they I think of I'm thinking of my sister actually right um, where I think my my parents did a really good job of having a good family culture and a good job of of you know encouraging us to read good things and and read read the Bible but um, I don't think there was actually a way in which they presented those things and, and, and helped us to grapple with those things in a, in a way that encouraged us to love them. And so, you know, my sister has, you know, left the faith and, and, and I think there's a way in which she lost her taste for the things that are beautiful because they actually weren't coupled with something that's um, with, a, with a beautiful way of, of learning those things, okay? Um, and so I think what our goal is as a classical school is not just to read, not just to expose your students to the great text and not just to have a culture that emphasizes faith and responsibility, but to make those things seem like they're full of life, full of the life that they actually are full of. And that's the pedagogy piece. It's a method of instruction that helps students to discover things, to love things, and, uh, and really to be, to be attracted to the things that you're presenting, okay? Um, and so, the point that I want to make here, at least today, is a distinctively classical curriculum and culture, um, or distinctively Christian classical, Catholic classical curriculum and culture, deserve a distinctively Catholic classical pedagogy. Right? Um, and so we want to pay attention, and you guys know this, your parents, right? You know if you present something to a student in the wrong way, or a child in the wrong way, they're going to hate it, right? Uh, you've seen students, you've seen your, your kids, you know, reject something that, that's good for them because they lost that taste for them and uh, lost, that, lost a taste for it, okay? And so I think if we want to think about what, if we want, you know, so tonight I want us to, A, catch a vision for what classical pedagogy actually looks like. What do we mean when we say, here's how your teachers are teaching their classes, okay? Um, and I'll give you a few examples. I'll do a, a bit of a model, a model lesson so you can help to understand a little bit what I mean here. Um, so just to see what's happening at school and then to say, okay, is there some ways in which that uh, I can take those same, those same principles and use them a little bit at home, right? Um, there where when I'm talking with my student over dinner or I'm you know, disciplining them or, <laughs> or whatever the case may be, um, is there a way in which I can be informed by the same kind of pedagogical principles that encourage learning, right? Um, and that's, that's really the goal of pedagogy here, is, it, is the goal is to encourage learning. So uh, let me begin, let me just give you a few, uh, uh, a thought here. This is Augustine, this is as philosophical as all, philosophical? This is philosoph as philosophical as I'm gonna get, uh, but just a thought here from Augustine. Um, notice this very first, line here, this is from a little treatise he writes called On Order. Um, it's just post-conversion, um, actually even pre-confessions post-conversion. Um, and uh, he writes this beautiful first line of this text. There is an order to be found within things and between them that binds and directs this world, right? I think that is, if we're talking about classical education, this is one of the lines that has, it, it haunts me in all the best ways, right? It, it's the thing that I can't get out of my head. It's, it's the fact that there's an order to the cosmos that God has woven into our world certain principles and, uh, um, and patterns that are in line with his character, right? And that we can find them and that they are within us and in our relationships between us uh, that unite us together in an increasingly fract fractured world um, and that help to guide our actions. Like that, that is... We stand for something as a school. I hope we stand for some, for this. Um, but notice that second line here. All right, second line is scary. All right, to attain and retain that order, to open one's eyes and other people's to it, is difficult and very uncommon. All right, it's actually a pedagogical point that he's making here. Right, it's actually this order is all encompassing and glorious but actually passing on a taste for that order is not an easy thing. Right? You guys know this because, of, because parenting is not easy. Right? Think of all the things you want your students to want to pass on to your children. It's not an easy thing. Right? It takes something to actually make that happen. It's not gonna, you know, you don't just kind of say, here you go, son, here's the order of the cosmos. 
Right? That's not pedagogy, right? That's just, that's just pure curriculum. And so there's a way in which we can take that order and the art of eye opening right, is the idea of pedagogy. How are you, where, and Augustine is realizing this, you know, it's, it's been known that it's not just, you don't just sort of hand someone the Bible and say, good luck, right? That there's a way of actually helping them to come to love and understand that thing. Um, and that's what we're interested in for pedagogy here. So um, uh, well, what I want to think through today first, what is classical pedagogy? Where to give you, equip you with an, an, an answer. It's not the only one, but it's the one I've been, uh, uh, and I don't think we have very good answers as a classical school movement, and this will be one. Uh, two, I'm gonna give you an example. I'm gonna try to teach a lesson for you. I think I'm gonna do something first grade, uh, so something accessible, hopefully. So, um, And then a little bit of a question, what is this gonna mean for, for education at the home here? So uh, let me give you a few buzzwords here. I don't think these are actually all that helpful when it comes to classical pedagogy, but if you're interested in just some, these are the key talking, the key things that I think are central to classical pedagogy. Uh, number one, centered in wonder. If there's a word that you've heard, about what the school is interested in as far as pedagogy, it's, it's, it's wonder here, right? Where I want my students, I want my children to actually be, uh, to, to, to marvel at the things that are marvelous um, and to inquire after them more and more, right? We equivocate on the word wonder actually. It means two things. It means marveling and also means inquiring, thinking about things that we don't know. Um, and so if you're interested in wonder, Classical pedagogy should be oriented towards wonder. Uh, you might call it the first philosophy of classical pedagogy. Um, but it's not all that helpful, right? It's not, it's not all that practical. I can't just say to a teacher, well, you should get kids wondering. Like, it's not all that helpful. Like, uh, it's not a practical thing. And the same with this idea of Socratic, where you're like, okay, well, do I have to act like Socrates? Like, do I have to go read the Republic? What does this actually mean? Right? But if there's a way in which we describe pedagogy, a lot of times it means Socratic. Uh, a lot of times Socratic, uh, one word you can substitute for is just sort of question-centered. Right? Socratic pedagogy is interested in, uh, it's an interrogative pedagogy where I, as a teacher, I'm going to ask questions and the students are going to offer the answers. Right? So it's, it's, it's opposite to telling them things. I'm not going to, I'm not going to just lecture at them, but I'm going to pose questions and solicit their responses. Um, but again, not all that helpful, like teach Socratically, okay, great, thanks, thanks Dr. Craig, right. I'll go do that. Right. It's not, not all that practical here, right? we need some, some tangible vision. Uh, pedagogy that's teacher-led and student-driven um, is one of the ways in which we would try to describe classical pedagogy, um, or you often hear some of these words, active, uh, participatory, embodied, these types of words I think find their way into pedagogy a lot. But I don't think this is actually all that helpful for a teacher, I don't think it's actually all that helpful for you um, so to try to actually get you to catch a vision for what it looks like to teach classically, I am proposing the following shape. Ta-da! Thank you. Uh, I mean, you no, uh, so this is obviously a ridiculous picture, but the, but, but the idea here is what is this, when I'm actually designing something that's going to make a student learn something, this is the design I want to follow. This is, and, there's nothing, uh, so let me, let me think, about, think about the word classical with me for just a second, right? We tend to think classical means old here, yes? Um, actually, classical in the Latin doesn't come from anything resembling old, right? Classical uh, comes from classicus, which means best, okay? Uh, so there, a lot of times the best things are old because they've stood the test of time, right? Uh, but they... Uh, the interesting thing is, a lot of times you guys, without knowing it, will probably have arrived at some sort of version of this because it's just the best way to get someone to learn something. Um, there's nothing particularly old about this. Um, and in fact, a lot of times, even when you get into, when you walk into a really good progressive, mat, progressive classroom, uh, it kind of looks like this because a teacher has figured out this is how I get my kids to learn something. Or a parent has figured out, this is how I get my kids to learn something. Right? What I'm interested in pedagogically is learning. So uh, what does the shape actually mean here? Okay. Um, uh, I'm beginning with this lightning bolt image up here, uh, which I'm calling an opening question. Okay. So what your teachers are going to try to do is begin the class. They're going to walk in and propose a question for students to consider. Okay. It's kind of so Socratic in some way. I'll give an example in just a second. The idea is I am you, you know, 
right? I am throwing a lightning bolt in the middle of class and seeing what the students do with it, right? Uh, you can picture, you can imagine yourself as Zeus if you like, uh, but the idea is you're, um, you're scattering, the, you're disturbing the students in some way. Hopefully they don't, aren't actually disturbed, but, but you're disturbing their comfort zone. They're getting out of their comfort zone. They're being challenged to take what you know and explore beyond that thing. Right? That's an opening question, right? Because why do we learn stuff? We learn stuff because we have the desire to discover it, right? I recently learned how to put Freon in my car. Why did I learn how to put Freon in my car? Because I was hot while I was driving and the AC didn't work. And so, and because I got a quote from my mechanic and it was four figures and I was like, I don't have that money. I'm going to go to YouTube and figure this out myself. Like, Why do we learn stuff? We learn stuff from desire. And so a lightning bolt in the middle is attempting to say, you are insufficient with your current knowledge, right? You need to have more knowledge, right? It, and uh, the, the fancy education term for this is cognitive dissonance, right? They have some sort of disruption in their current understanding, and they are required to think about it and hopefully expand their knowledge, right? We learn something out of desire. I now know how to put Freon in the car because I had the cognitive dissonance of being very hot, right? Um, there's a great, uh, uh, one of my favorite writers on math pedagogy, uh, says uh, learning begins with desire, right? Uh, and he's right, right? You don't learn something unless you actually want it or feel that you need it, right? Um, and so motivating the desire in the student is what happens, okay? I'll give an example of this in just a second uh, so that it makes a little more sense. Uh, what you have, these blue arrows now, are different student responses that are gonna happen in the classroom, okay? I threw a lightning bolt in the middle, and what we now have is different students having different ideas. All right, so I have to come up with a good opening question, but the idea is your student, the students then get to have thoughts. And I, as a teacher, am not just gonna lecture at my students, but I'm gonna care what my students think. I'm gonna ask them, I'm gonna uh, uh, elicit, is the, is the word we use a lot of times, right? Elicit student thinking. So I'm gonna throw a lightning bolt in the middle, and students are going to respond to that in various ways, okay? So I'm involving my students immediately at, with this initial question, and I care what they think immediately, okay? Then what I'm gonna do here is take those different student responses and ask again a series of follow-up questions that are designed to prune, press on, get them to further articulate, figure out, problem solve, progress further until we finally get some sort of a key idea or you can, a lot of times I call this a, a truth, right? So I have a truth that I want my students to be able to uh, either know or a skill that I want them to do or something that I want them to, to, to walk away with, a takeaway as, if you will, right? But instead of coming out and handing that to them, right? I'm going to have them do the work of discovering that thing um, because that's how we learn and love something if we've done the work to get there ourselves, right? If someone kind of hands something to us, we don't often learn it and we don't often really want it. Um, so the, the idea here is I'm going to arrive at some sort of truth through a series of questioning and thinking. Um, and then what I'm gonna do a lot of times is I'm going to uh, practice it, do some examples, think about some applications, repeat it a lot of times, figure it out, explore its nuances, et cetera. Um, so I'm going to actually make some, um, make some progress with that key idea. Um, but, the I but, the, but the idea of pedagogy is that I'm first going to stimulate the desire in my students, and then I'm going to take their ideas and follow up with them until they arrive somewhere via my questioning, but via their answers at something that's actually meaningful, okay? Um, that they're going to um, be the ones to take the steps of learning, right? Um, until they actually encounter the thing itself, okay? Um, there's, um, the way I know this is classical, okay? 
uh, or why I imagine this is classical, okay? Uh, where uh, this is just Aristotle talks about, you know, I know that some of you are turning, tuning me out after I said the word Aristotle, but uh, Aristotle talks about the mean between extremes as sort of the thing we want to shoot for, right? That there are vices on either side. Um, there's vice in excess and there's vice in deficiency, okay? Um, and I think what we have here is actually classical pedagogy being a mean between extremes, where I think what we have is actually a couple of alternative pedagogies that classical pedagogy is pushing against. Uh, the first one is progressive pedagogy. Uh, it's what you see in a lot of education schools. It's what you see in a lot of um, sort of very progressive schools that are interested in this. And it's, it's a pedagogy of student empowerment. It's a pedagogy of uh, activities a lot of times, projects where we're interested in letting the students, you know, a lot of times progressive pedagogy gets the very first half of this right. It gives the students activities and it's like, have a thought. And whatever that thought is, follow that, right? That's the idea of progressive pedagogy is you wanna empower students to go their own direction whatever way that is. And you want to facilitate that as a teacher. You want to, want to you don't want to, you, you absolutely don't want to force them into anything, right? You're going to let their desires be the ones that are going to guide you, okay? Um, that's progressive pedagogy, okay? It's progressive parenting, okay? Where you're interested in just being the one to let your students explore, or let your children follow their dreams and heart, whatever they are. Now, there's something to that, right? We certainly, I mean, it's a part of really good pedagogy. You certainly want to uh, draw on student desires and thoughts, right? Uh, but there's also, there's, you know, we don't believe that there's any truth that we actually want our students to get to. We just want them to be empowered to do what they want, okay? Um, and that's a pedagogical philosophy that's, uh, I think, going to grow and grow in popularity. Um, it certainly is growing and growing in, in the ed schools of education, in the training of teachers, okay? Um, there's also this other vice that is what I'm calling hyperclassical pedagogy, where it's, here's the truth, I'm gonna tell it to you, you're gonna repeat it over and over and over again, and you're gonna practice it, and you're gonna practice it, and you're never gonna question it, because it's the truth, and it's good, and you're gonna deal with it, right? I call it hyperclassical, you can call it authoritarian, and it's the same as authoritarian parenting, right? Uh, you will not explore things outside of this. You will have the truth and it will be handed to you over and over again and never arrived at, right? Uh, the analogy I like is imagine a Thanksgiving dinner, right? Uh, progressive pedagogy hands, you a blank hands the child a blank check and says, go to the store and get what you want for Thanksgiving. Hyperclassical pedagogy takes the turkey and the cranberry sauce and the pumpkin pie and puts it in a blender and pushes puree, grinds it all up and hands it to the kid with a straw, right? Neither of those are actually getting them to love and enjoy the meal itself, participate in its construction, right? It's just good teaching and good parenting, right? We do have some things that we want our students to walk away with. We want our children to love and know, right? But the best way to get them to learn that is not to ram it down their throats, right? It's to help them do some work to get, via questioning to, to arrive at that on their own, okay? So especially this idea of of follow-up questions I think is one of the things that is unique to classical pedagogy where um, I do care what my students think or what my children think. I want to involve their thinking, but I also am going to, I'm willing to have the conversations with them. I'm willing to press on that thinking. I want to say, oh, you believe that? Why do you believe that, right? Why do you think that? What if it were this? Would you still think that? Is there a better way that you can imagine? These types of follow-up questions just press on student thinking until they're actually getting, you know, they're, it's not just whatever reaction comes naturally you go with, right? This may seem common sense, um, but I think there's legitimate pedagogical philosophies, a, a vicious pedagogical philosophies on either side here, okay? All right, cool, this is a shape. What does that actually look like? Okay, let me do an example, okay? 
um, let me do something that you couldn't possibly make interesting or come alive. Uh, uh, let me do first grade multiplication, all right? If there's anything that feels soul sucking, it's first grade multiplication, yes? Um, if I can take this pedagogy and make it come alive for you in some way, to get you to discover and desire to know multiplication, right? That's the goal here with this. To say, you know, where, how do we, if I put you in front of a classroom and I said teach multiplication, what would you do? You'd probably do it this way. This is probably how you were taught multiplication. This is just how we tend to teach. We tend to say, all right, kids, today we're going to learn a new word. The word is kind of long, so I want you to repeat it after me. The word is called multiplication. Can you guys say that with me? Multiplication. Excellent, multiplication, right? Um, and multiplication is, I'm going to tell you what it is, multiplication is actually repeated addition. Can you guys say that with me? Multiplication is? Addition. Excellent. So what I have is, if I have something like repeated addition here, so I have something like 3, a plus 3, plus 3, plus three, plus three, a repeated addition here, I can actually rewrite that with multiplication, right? And there's a special sign that we use for multiplication. It's a big X. Can you guys make a big X with your hands? It's an X, right? And so the way I can write this is I can count how many threes there are. Can you guys count with me how many threes we have? We have That's exactly right. We have five threes here. And so what we have is five, and that's how many groups we have. And then we use our multiplication sign. And then th there are five threes. So there's five. This is how many are in each group. And this is how I would take this problem and rewrite my repeat addition with multiplication. So we can actually figure out the answer to this 5x3 here, right? Uh, because it's going to be the same answer. So let's take a look at this, right? Can you guys count with by threes with me? This is going to be kind of tricky. But let's count and see if we can figure out what the answer to the addition is. That's exactly right. And so since this is the same thing, that we have five groups of three, there's still going to be 15 here as well. Okay. And we actually use a special word instead of saying x here. We use a special multiplication word. The word is called times. Can you guys say that? Times. So we would read this as 5 times 3 equals 15. And that's multiplication, guys. All right. Should we let's practice a few all right. Okay, so this is all right. Uh, uh, cut. Um, the <laughs> This is how we normally teach things, right? This is, it's, it's, but it's this, right? It's, it's this guy, right? It's, I'm already figured out what multiplication is. I'm going to hand it to you, and you've got to deal with it, all right? Uh, there's no desire, right? You may get some buy-in from some students who either want to please their teacher, right? Or they are scared of getting bad grades, or their parents have made them, right? Etc. But there's no actual love of the thing, and there's no desire. And thus, there's really no learning other than learning via compulsion. And I don't think learning via compulsion is the way that we want our children to grow up. Okay? So the goal of classical pedagogy is to still do that eventually. I still want them to be able to rewrite. I want, I want them to know the formula. I want them to be able to rewrite this thing. But I want to back up my pedagogy to something that's here that I'm going to throw a lightning bolt in the middle of the class and see what happens. And I want them to have lots of thoughts. And then I want to be able to follow up on those thoughts to get them to be the ones to say, I want to invent that thing. I want that. OK? It's a challenge. It's a huge challenge as a teacher. This is why, this is what ha when you think about Teacher Appreciation Week, this is the kind of thing you should appreciate about good teachers is that they can take something like this and figure out, what could I ask to get my students to care and love and learn about these types of things? So let me try. Here's what I'm going to do. All right, kids. Today I've got an interesting question for you guys. 
Which of these two things do you think is going to be an easier problem? To figure out how many fingers we have as a class, or to figure out how many pets we have as a class? Lightning bolt. Okay, so the point here is, okay, where is he going with this? Like, and you guys are being bad first graders because I have a first grader and she is two things. She is uh, opinionated and thoughtless, right? And so they're going to be caught fingers, pets, fingers, pets is what's fun about first grade classes when you actually have some life in them, right? Fingers, pets, right? And so I'll be able to say, I can watch, uh, pause for a second, right? Watch in this thing how many statements I say. I, I, I guarantee you it won't be very many, okay? I can teach this whole thing via questions, and I'm going to get the students to say these things, where I can say something, okay, let's, what would we have to do to figure out the pets one? What would we have to do? Yeah, let's talk about everyone has any pets. How many pets do you have? One. How many pets do you have? One. How many pets do you have? How many pets do you have? How many pets do you have? The same, the same, zero, right. Do my kids count? No, uh, how many pets do you have? Zero. zero. Right, and so on and so forth, okay? Right. And then how could we take this and actually figure it out? What would we have to do? We'd have to add them. Why would we have to add them up? Because we want to figure out the total, right? And we have to figure out. So we would add them all up, right? Oh, as a class, we have this many pets. Now, how do we have to do it with fingers? What can we do with fingers? Can we do the same thing? We can, sure, right? How many fingers do you have? How many fingers do you have? How many fingers do you have? I have eight. The two of them are thumbs, right? You know which kid. You know, you know that's your kid, right? But that's what you want. You want that kid. You want that kid in the class. You want the life. You want, to, you want him to bring the, bring the sarcasm. You want that. That's what I want in the class anyways, right? right. Ten, ten. I'm going to pause. Do we have to keep asking everyone? Why not? Why not? We all have ten fingers. Oh, interesting. So what do I need to know to figure out the fingers problem? OK. I need to know how many students. And then what else do I need to know? Is it just enough if I say, I'm solving a problem and I've got 14 students? I need to know how many fingers each student has. OK? And then I can do what? I can count by. I can count by tens, right? And so then I can ask something like, oh, why would that not work for pets? Because everyone has a different number of pets. Interesting. So what are some other scenarios that are like that fingers problem, where everyone has the same toes? <laughs> you know which kid that. You know which kid you are. What are some other examples? Eyes. How about some non-body part ones? Shoes. Shoes, sure. Wheels on a car. Right. And what I've done there, so cut a little bit here, right? What I've done is I've got them to think through, OK, there are certain situations in this world that are addition-y with a why. I'm not going to explain this to them, but this is what they've had to grapple with, right? And those situations are when everyone has unique numbers of things. And there are other situations in this world where we have the same thing happening. Right? And those things are unique. Those things are multiplication-y. Right? It's, really, it's getting, you know, none, of your first, none of the first graders are going to think of, you know, ontologically about the nature of the cosmos here. Right? That's not what they're going to walk away with. But they're going to be like, oh, sometimes I don't need to do all the additions. Sometimes all I need to do is figure out the groups, which is what they said, and the number that are in each group. And then I can come and say, what you guys are doing here, when you're doing the fingers problem, you're doing multiplication. And then I can actually teach them this word, because what they've done is they've arrived at that word via their own exploration, that they've actually figured out that, oh, there are, this is a different kind of problem, and therefore might require a different bit of math. And I didn't do anything other than ask a set of questions. Right, I asked an opening question about right, 
what, uh, you know, what's the difference between these two things? Wasn't it all related to multiplication? And then I followed up with these questions that slowly got them to say, oh, hey, hey, there's something different going on here. I got to figure this new thing out. This is different than it. I've disturbed their world. And then they come to say, OK, actually, that disruption means I've got to adjust. I've got to say, oh, there's something new going on here. That's interesting. What can I do to respond to that new thing? How can I? They're essentially reinvent. There's a fancy education term called guided reinvention. And this is a little bit about what they're doing. They are, you are helping them to reinvent the same thing, right? It's the same thing if you're, if you're leading devotions or you're teaching scripture, right? You can interpret the story for them and you can give them that, right? Interpretation, or you can ask them what they see and what they notice. And a lot of times, as long as you're asking a good set of questions and making sure they're not going completely off the rails, right? They're going to arrive at that kind of interpretation themselves. And that's the kind of ownership over knowledge that we're interested in, right? Because what they've done here is they've actually said, oh, I'm discovering this kind of multiplication on my own, right? Or I'm, we're discovering it together. And the way that I do that as a teacher is I follow this kind of a shape that gives, you know, it's not just do whatever you want, students. And it's not, here's the answers, students. It's, let's do this together and figure it out together. And that's what your teachers are interested in when we hop into the classroom. We do that kind of pedagogy when we work classically. So that the great things, right? So, right, go back to your curriculum, right? If these are great ideas and great texts and great things that we want our students to know, right? I'm going to resist the temptation to just force them into that. But I'm also going to resist the temptation to just say, well, whatever you want to think is fine. Right? But there's something in the middle where I know where I want them to go, but I'm interested in them actually going there. I'm facilitating. I'm the one who's sort of guiding, but I'm not doing it for them. I'm not. They're doing the intellectual work. And I think one of the key things why we care about Socratic pedagogy is because those questions allow for the students to populate those with their thoughts and allow for me to prune those thoughts. If I know what my kid is thinking, I can actually work with that. That's a thing I can work with. And so asking these good opening questions that get your students responding and then being willing to have the conversation with them until you work together and arrive somewhere good, those are the kind of moments that I think real learning starts to happen. And when I say real learning, I mean lasting learning, learning that's loved, and learning that translates into action and character and habit. Right? Um, if I'm forcing you to do a thing, it's not often going to show up as habit. And if I just let you derive whatever habits you want, you're not going to come up with good ones. Right? This is just basic parenting. You guys all know this. But the, seeing it as a pedagogical vision or a pedagogical shape, I think, is, is important for us when we're thinking about what our classrooms should look like and what our homes should look like as well, right? Um, because if we want our students to learn a set of things, which I hope we all do, right, um, we actually have to be interested not just in them hearing it from us, uh, but them actually um, gets translated into the, you know, some sort of real currency that they love and abide by. So, yeah, for sure. So a parent that uh, takes this lesson and uh, let's say they <laughs> write all the multiplication facts on posters and hang them up around the house, um, yeah. is that following that same idea, that same concept, or the problem yeah. that, hey, let's make flashcards? Sure. Okay. No, I mean, I think they can. Um, but I think th the kinds of questions that I would ask while doing flashcards Right? It's not just about repeat over and over and over again until you figure this out, but like, let's talk about patterns. And uh, what do you notice? What do you see as we're doing this? Make an op you know, challenging them with, this, with some kind of an open-ended question to say, what do you see here? Right? Have a, and, and be willing to have that conversation instead of just the drill, the drill, the drill. The drill. I think that there's drill that's, drill's okay, right? Especially when it comes to math facts. Math facts are a bit of a pedagogical 
exception in my mind. Uh, we can go down that rabbit hole if we want to. But I think if you're just, you know, I'm thinking of something like scripture memory, that like I am interested in them. That feels a little more drill-like, where I want them to have, you know, they're not going to maybe love that, but I want them to know it and have committed to memory, right? Um, but I think if you pair, the, if you just say, memorize this, next week we're going to memorize this, memorize, next week we're going to memorize this, right? And, and there's, I don't think that's going to be the most effective thing you can do at home rather than having the conversations about things that they're noticing, things that they're thinking about. And so I, want to, I would want to pair, like, you don't, you, I think this is a key part of classical pedagogy, which is a little bit more what you're talking about, some of these applications or practice um, or repetition. Right? But it's not the only thing that shows up. Just because I have my students repeat and or children repeat something over and over again, you know, doesn't guarantee that they're going to have, that it's going to be combined with the kind of actual love and knowledge that I want to combine it with. So I'm OK with you doing, I mean, I think we should practice things with our students. I think we should. Or, and our children. I think we should help them to memorize certain things. I think we should repeat things to them, right? But if that's the entirety of your pedagogy, we're missing something, right? Can I address some uh, bad memory or memorization is the mother of all learning. And I think I read that on classical yeah. campus. Yeah. So, so um, the. I, I think that's probably fine. I think I think the um, uh, a lot of times it's a lot of times it's memory. Is it the mother of invention? Sometimes repetition, repetition is the mother of invention. Yeah, something similar there. Yeah. Um, and, yeah repetition is the mother of learning. Necessity is the mother of learning. It's the mother of invention. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. So so um, I think there's something to this. Um, but think about how you commit something to memory, right? or how you actually learn the thing. Um, often hearing it said over and over again is not the best way to actually commit something to memory. right? Um, if you, again, talk to me about the, the, the way of, of actually knowing how to change the Freon in my car, you, I could have watched a lecture. I would have to watch that lecture 50 times before I would be able to understand that thing. Whereas if you actually get in there and do it with me one time, I'm actually going to know that or memorize it a lot better if it's learned, if it's arrived at in something that's a little more dynamic. right? Um, so I'm not, I, I think you're absolutely right that we want our students and our children to have memorized good things. Um, but a lot of times, the way in which we learn or memorize something um, is, looks significantly more like this than it does like this. Um, I, think, I think the best is when you can combine them, uh, which is, I think, what the picture is getting at. There's like some sort of combination of those things. Um, but the, again, um, you know, memory without love is really, is, 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 ends up being really tough. Like, I, I can't get my sister's image out of my head when I think about this. Like, she could give me, she could quote the Bible backwards and forwards to me, but, Right, um, I think the it was never coupled with that kind of like um, those the the kinds of conversations and questions that are going to help her to love that thing on her own. Um, and I think I think I think there's a there's a way in which over focus on repetition um, can dull the heart towards the thing, the very thing that you're trying to help them to love. Um, uh, don't mishear me. I think I think repetition and, and memory I think is a key part of classical pedagogy, uh, but it's only part, right? Um, yeah, uh, good question. Other other questions or thoughts people have? I have a few. Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, subject matter and grade level. Yeah, subject matter and grade level I think is pretty. Um, I would I do some of these similar things if kindergartners like you know if I were teaching, uh, let's go twelfth grade. Uh, if I were teaching the fundamental theorem of calculus, okay. Some of you just like shriveled in your, you're like, ooh, I'm not pleased. Right. But I, I would do this, right? I'd walk in and I'd say, all right, guys, today, how much area? Huh, Mr. Ray, I don't know. It's too hard. Right. Yeah, and now you're in 12th grade mode, right? 12th graders are not uh, 
12th graders are not uh, opinionated and thoughtless. 12th graders are moody and uh, unwilling to put themselves out there in front of their peers, right? <laughs> Mr. Greg, I don't know. This is a blob. This is, uh, and you get the kid. It's got some area. <laughs> the class clown, right? This, this is great. There's not even any lines. There's not lines. Okay, all right. You want lines? Here we go. How much area? Right? And so again, it's this, it's this opening question that I can then follow up on and I can say, okay, is it, I ask some follow up questions, is it more or less than 20? It's less. How do you know? And I'm getting them to explain that it's why it's less than 20. What could you do to get a better one? Well, you know, their explanation for why it's less than 20. Well, there's like through, you know, six full ones and some half ones. You know, eventually some kid would be like, well, what if we divided the grids into quarters? And now can we make a count? Is that going to be a better approximation? It is. Why? And I'm asking all these questions. And some kid is going to be like, we should divide it infinitely small. And you're like, Yes, we should, right? I mean, like, the, but the idea, it's the same kind of thing where I can do the same shape here at a first grade level, at a 12th grade level. It's going to be different, right? A first grade shape is maybe going to be five minutes long. It's not going to, you don't have this. Whereas the fundamental theory of calculus discussion, that might be a two-day shape, right? Um, but the idea is it's the same kind of way in which we learn things, right? Because the shape here is we're interested in, 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 in learning, so. Yeah, and I think across disciplines as well, right? Uh, if I'm going to teach uh, the Battle of Gettysburg uh, in history, I might walk in and I might say, all right, um, how do you know when it's important to be brave and decisive versus when it's important to be cautious? Why am I asking that, right? Where we're gonna, uh, uh, and they're going to have thoughts, right? Everyone's going to have some thoughts about this, right? Um, and the Get Battle of Gettysburg has a lot of moments where on day one of the battle, it was super important to try to be decisive and brave, right? To get that high ground at the very beginning, that was key. But day three, right, uh, it would have been better if the South had been more, if they had actually been a little more cautious instead of just charging forward, right? Um, these types of things where I'm posing these questions and I'm getting students, instead of saying, here's the facts that you guys need to learn about what's going on here, right? I'm posing something that they can grapple with and come to try to understand it. I'm not just leaving them on their own, and there are some things that like, I want them to walk away knowing X, Y, and Z about the battle, right? but it's, it's going to be, if you can consistently expose students to good questions, um, and then help them to grapple with them in some real meaningful fashion, that's going to be the essence of teaching. So I think this, this shape is supposed to be, you know, it's not perfect, right? uh, but the idea is it's supposed to be something that it can unite our pedagogy behind something like this. This is really a pedagogy of wonder, where you begin immediately by being thrown into wonder, thrown into something that you don't know. And then at the end, the goal is to get somewhere where you can marvel at that thing that you arrived at. Oh, that's multiplication. Oh, the fundamental theorem of calculus. Oh, right, this is the kind of, uh, like, like you, instead of me walking in and be like, all right, kids, get out of your notebooks. Here's the fundamental theorem of calculus. Like, that's is not going to be accepted into some sort of, like, uh, currency of knowledge here. Other questions people have so far? Where, how am I doing on time? Where am I at here? I'm doing really poorly on time. Uh, OK, so um, just a couple quick thoughts here. So uh, this shape is really nice, but let's think about a little bit. Um, uh, I just want to I'll do this, these couple slides really quickly, but just to think through what are some wit opening questions that are good? What are some things that we care about as human beings? I ask my students to notice things. What do you see? Why does that make sense? These are the kind of things you, kinds of questions we can ask them just at home as well, right? What do you see around you? Why does this, why might they be doing this? Why might this be a thing that our world has chosen, people in our world has chosen to do, right? 
Get them to observe. What do you see? What do you see around you? What's going on here? Help them to start to make sense of things. We ask them to compare. Which is better, this or this? Why is it better? Right? It's the classic and cheesy take your kids shopping uh, th thing. But the idea is you know, actually have them compare things and say, you know, which is better? Do you like this thing or do you like this thing? And then the follow-up questions write themselves. Why do you like those things? Would you like it better if it were still this way? What is it the thing that you like about this thing? These types of questions. I ask my students to create, to imagine, to draw, to come up with, to design. Design me, uh, thinking about academic context, design me a situation that the Roman system of government would really struggle to deal with. Design me a game that seems fair but isn't. Design me something that, ha that feels like it's alive but not actually alive. All the good questions I can come up with, like, you know, that I'm trying to teach the seven characteristics of life, and that's my opening question. I'm asking them to imagine or to create. Right, we work on imaginations a lot. I ask my students to struggle. What if it were this way? How much area? What's X? And I ask them to struggle to grapple with these things. To them, they're going to be like, oh, I need this. Ah, yes, I can give you that. That type of thing. Right? I ask them to, be, to encounter difficult situations. Number five, I ask them to puzzle. I ask them to fit pieces together, to figure out how this all fits together. Um, and number six, I ask them a lot of times to reflect. These are all questions you can do with them at home. Okay. These are the kinds of things that we're asking them to do on a regular basis at school. Um, these are the things that when they encounter the world around them, these are, the, these are certain things that I am asking them to be the ones to, to actually think through these types of things. Right? This is what we have to do as adults on a regular basis. We have to do all of these things right? to figure out what is going on. We have to compare things. Right? Uh, we actually have to design and make things right? uh, and test them. We have to struggle to figure out how to overcome some sort of adversity, how to problem solve in the midst of things that are not easy. Right? Uh, we have to puzzle and figure out how things fit. Um, and then we have to be reflective in some way. Okay? And so I think if you're, you know, these, are the, these are the kind of lightning bolty type questions that force your children out of their comfort zone and having to actually do some thinking. Um, let me talk follow-up questions for just a second. So we go back to our shape here. Uh, it's taking forever. Things that I had you here, you can't control the responses. Uh, you know, in general, the, the key ideas. But this idea of open, asking them questions Socratically um, and asking them to uh, oh, opening questions and follow-up questions, right? Follow-up questions. The idea here is conversation, right? So ask something where students actually are going to provide a response and then follow up on that thing. Say, ask them another question. Ask them to go deeper. Ask them these types of things where I'm just talking about some good follow-up questions here. Something like this, right? What do you notice? What could we try? Why is this difficult? What's tough about it? How is this one different than the other ones? How'd you figure that one out? What was the key to doing that? What was your strategy? Do you think this is always going to work? What if it were this way? These are just the kinds of questions that I'm going to ask in the classroom students on a regular basis to get them to not just have a single re reaction and be like, well, here's my opinion. I'm going to say, OK, well, what about x, y, z, w? Think through these things where your students are a lot of times kids are going to be impulsive. They're going to have reactions. They're going to want to do things. And to get them, you know, you can let them do those things if you want to. Uh, but then afterwards, talk about it with them. Say, why'd you, why'd you make that choice? This is the easiest, not the easiest thing, but the best thing to do with discipline conversations. Right? What happened here? Do you think that was a good choice? Why do you think that was a good choice? Did you make that choice? Would you make it again? Would you make it for a little bit different? What do you think the consequence? I mean, like, these are, this is, this is 
again, the, you guys have arrived at this kind of thing probably on your own, but this is the kind of parenting where they're actually going to maybe learn something from discipline. Doesn't happen always, but instead of you giving them a 15 minute lecture on why that thing they did was wrong, like they're tuning you out immediately, right? A conversation though, where they're the ones being asked to provide reflections and answers, that might be worth it, right? It's the kind of thing where they're actually, uh, you know, we, if we teach via these types of questions and we're equipped with a actual means of having real conversations with our kids, um, that's when I think we see some sort of learning, okay? Um, uh, so let me end here, right? Uh, what are some, um, and I can open up for a few questions if you're interested, um, right? Uh, first, uh, so some takeaways here. Number one, uh, don't forget about the pedagogy piece. Both when you're talking about classical education, uh, if you're talking to a friend about classical, what, your school, what the school is like, uh, but also at home where we need to pay attention, not just putting good stuff in front of our kids and not just creating a good school culture, but let's think about how we're actually communicating those things to our children, okay? Uh, you wouldn't necessarily call it pedagogy so much as you'd call it parenting style or something like this at home. Uh, but parenting style is going to matter a, a, a good deal. And having in mind learning, I think, is the same thing we do in the classroom. Um, uh, every parent is gonna ask different kinds of questions and play to their kinds of strength. But the idea is um, how can you do the work of, uh, how can you do the pedagogical work um, to try to present the truths that you want your, student, your children to walk away with in some sort of um, dynamic fashion. Um, so a few thoughts for classical pedagogy at home. Um, uh, number one, right? Uh, cultivate some opportunities uh, where your students have to grapple with certain things, where they're dealing, uh, I've called it complex decision making, I don't really love this. Um, but the goal here is we don't necessarily always want to oversimplify things for our children, okay? I think there are some simple answers that really are meaningful, right? Um, but the, what I'm interested in a lot of times with children is some ways in which they're being asked to do something that is, um, they're having to uh, put a, a number of things together or they're having to say, oh, that's not super easy. How could I do this, right? Games often matter a lot, right? Uh, I think playing games with your kids is really great and a lot of times you can talk about strategy, et cetera. Art is really good, exercising their imagination and you know, again, these are opportunities for good conversations, right? Um, they're having to cooperate with different things. I mean, shopping, building, creating, have them plan something out, right? I remember my mom, I think mostly out of frustration, but she made each one of the kids plan a meal every week. And I was like, and then, right? Uh, and then, and I was like, but I'm really thankful she did, right? Uh, because it forced me to be like, oh, who doesn't just magically appear? You actually have to make plans, right? Um, and you actually have to do some work to pull this off. Um, and just in the, the, com the complexity with which you had to make those decisions, um, I think is, is an opportunity to ask good questions and have good conversations. So look for things that are going to be good fruit for good conversations. You have to put good things in front of them, especially things that are going to be to force them to do some sort of thinking, okay? Um, where there's a tendency in parenting to make your kids' lives easy and simple. Um, I think there's, I don't think that's a, necessarily a bad reaction uh, or a bad inclination as a parent. We certainly wanna protect and shield our, our, our children from some things that are gonna really disturb them. I think that makes a lot of sense. Uh, but I think we overdo it at times. There are times in which they're, they can be asked to deal with some things in a safe environment that challenge them to come up with a plan and execute it and talk about it, these types of things. Uh, uh, number two, ask your children some open-ended type questions here, okay? Um, right, where a lot of times we ask one-word answer questions or a lot of times we, we tell them things and lecture at them um, and I think trying to ask what they see, what they notice, what they think. What do you think about this? What do you think about this? You know, what do you see here? 
Why might this be, why might this make sense? Does this make sense? Should we do this? Should we not do this? Do we need to do this? Are you gonna do this? These types of things, why not? Why'd you do what you did? Would you do it the same way again? Would you get better at it? Is there a way we can do this better? Involving them in these types of things, in these types of conversations, um, some sort of open-ended type questions, I think, uh, not, not open-ended in like, do what you want, but open-ended in like, you know, it's actually, you know, I'm not just gonna dictate to you, um, we're going to have some sort of conversation about what's going on here, right? Um, uh, number three, I think, is, is, is one thing that I've, I struggle to do as a parent, um, but take their ideas and run with them at least a little bit, okay? It's often really, if you see your student doing something, having a misguided idea, or as a parent having a misguided idea, it's really great to be the one to correct that. Oh, you don't wanna do that, you wanna do it this way. Um, <laughs> I've been, uh, I have now had the privilege of buying the uh, two different IKEA shelves twice. Uh, because they had, a kid had an idea about how to put it together, and I was like, all right, let's give it a shot. Where, like, I know it's gonna end up, it's not gonna go well, right? But that's, they're not gonna learn that unless you let them run with it, right? Let them fail, let them, let them fall a little bit, like, let them, and then instead of saying, here's what you did wrong, son, I know better, right? Uh, right? Ask them, what went wrong, right? What'd you, why didn't it work? What did we try? What might we try next? I mean, these types of things, like, they're so, it's, it's, it's hard as a parent. Uh-oh. It's time to be done is what it is here, right? I better actually have a power cord here. I can plug it in a sec, but, um, right? Uh, number four, I think this is important, right? Equip them to do the heavy lifting, right? Uh, I think this is when you're helping your kid with homework at home, right? Instead of trying to be the, you know, uh, Here's my favorite example for this one, right? Uh, I taught my, I taught my uh, five-year-old to ride a bike last year, okay? Um, and I, the way you, the best way to teach someone to ride, it's a good lecture, no. Uh, the, best, the best way to teach someone to ride a bike um, is to get in one of these balance bikes. Have you guys gotten one of these balance bikes ever before, right? Uh, they, it used to be you'd give them something with training wheels, right? Uh, and training wheels are the worst, right? Uh, balance bike is amazing, a balance bike, right? Uh, it has no pedals, but it also has, uh, you kind of can, uh, you, you push yourself with your feet, right? Uh, but you actually have to balance. It has no training wheels as well, right? And so, um, the, uh, when I actually taught her after a year on the balance bike to ride a bike, it took us 10 minutes to ride the bike because what she had done is I'd put her in an environment where she had to do the actual difficult thing of riding a bike. It was a safe environment because you know, if I just threw her on a bike, that wouldn't be good. She'd fall and hurt herself. But I, gave, I found a safe environment for her to do the heavy lifting of riding a bike, AKA learning how to balance. And then from that, now when she gets out into the, and has to ride the bike, you know, she's equipped to do that thing because they're the ones that have done the heavy lifting, right? If you get kids doing their homework at home and you're the one that's doing their heavy lifting on their homework and they go back at school, right? They're not going to be able to do that thing when they get out into the real world because you've done the heavy lifting for them, right? But the idea, ta-da. Haha, um, right? Um, but if you're if you're able to actually preserve the cognitive demand that's a, in a task, especially with homework, right? You wanna you can make it uh, you can make it easy for them in some way or safe for them in some way. But you wanna make sure they're the ones that are being challenged to do the heavy lifting. You're asking them to to actually fill in some of those things. Um, and then the last one, um, I think uh, this idea of empathy is really is really key, especially to pedagogy, where um, as a teacher, I wanna be one of my students' biggest cheerleaders, right? Uh, to rejoice when they're doing things that are, that um, when they overcome difficulty, right? Um, and also be willing to say, oh, our shelf didn't work. Like, oh, it's, our flying machine didn't fly, right? Um, um, but this idea of, of um, you know, it's not a chance to like, see, I told you so, kiddo. Like, it's a chance to put yourself in your shoes and actually have some authentic 
uh, feel what they feel and, and, and imagine what they imagine. So um, there are also a lot of other things to do at home, right? The curricular piece is important. Um, the culture piece is important. Uh, but if you think about some different pedagogical things that start to work their way into the home front, these would be a, a few things that I'd recommend just as far as how you can partner with the kind of pedagogy that's going on in a classical school, um, even as you do regular things with students. Um, and it's these kind of conversations that are truth oriented um, but that are open-ended, that begin open-endedly, that are, I think, are, bear the most fruit for learning. Um, and it's the same, th these conversations can happen either at home um, or, or at, at school. So um, I think those are, those are the fun kind of things to do with your students anyway. It's fun kind of things to do with your kids anyways. It's not as fun to lecture at them. It's much more fun to actually get in the weeds with them, feel what they feel, uh, think, figure out what they think talk to them about that thing. So um, now I actually will show this slide for real. Um, I'm happy to stay and chat if you have questions or, or, or thoughts. Um, I'm also happy if you want to reach out over email. My email is there as well. I'm happy to continue the conversation. Or if you disagree with all of this, I'm happy to chat with you as, as well. Um, but uh, thanks for coming out on a Thursday night. I appreciate the work that you guys do on a hard time. If we have time for questions, I'm happy to stay. Or if you want to release these people to, I can have smaller conversations yeah, too. Question. Thank you, Jake. Two. And, uh, just thank you. Yeah, one, one question. Yeah. Um, you know, a lot of times questions are being asked. So, you know, the lightning bolt that being thrown yeah. in, in the uh, schoolroom, and then the kid comes out and says, well, how was school today? Was really rough yeah. today. Right? Like, <laughs> do you have any recommendations yeah. for how teachers and parents <laughs> can connect so that yeah. Yeah. I mean, one of the things that that uh, you want to try to uh, one of the things I talk about as far as a follow up question or a, a pattern of questioning that works really well, uh, I call it a little, a little bit of a hook question, where what you want is to avoid the ah, it was good. So I think even just lending some specificity to your initial question will work a, a little bit. Like, tell me the most ridiculous thing that happened at school today. Tell me the awesomest thing that happened at school today. Tell me the most frustrating. I mean, even just like where you're getting, and all you need is a, a start to that conversation. You just need them to be able to say one thing that actually happened, and then you can have a conversation. You can kind of get that going. Um, but often, um, you know, uh, uh, which of your teachers taught the best class today? Like, I mean, just even even something that gets them thinking a little bit more specifically about their day and being willing to. I think one other thing that we don't do as much, um, uh, I don't know. I remember this actually. I remember being frustrated with my dad at some point about this, um, is uh, where we don't really share about our day a little bit. And I think, a com you know, I was like, dad, you always are. You, you, you always ask me how my day was, and you never, like, I, I don't know, I think, I think there's a way in which conversation happens is, is more mutual, right? Where you say, I was actually really frustrated at work today uh, myself, right? Uh, and I think trying to, trying to be able to have some sort of a mutual conversation works. I find kids share a little bit better then um, if I'm also willing to share some things about what's happening in my day. But, but I think just, just getting them... Um, Often the hard thing is getting them talking in the first place, um, and so giving yourself a a more specific type type question that they can actually latch onto at the beginning of a conversation like that helps. Um, and also just um, some things like um, uh, you know, um, kids are always going to say like, "Oh, it was fine. It was fine. It was fine. It was fine." You know, uh, where where you you want to, yeah. Rem, you know, if if there's uh, if there's something, you know, the, the, this is a little bit of a culture piece, but um, you know, if there's some sort of culture of sharing that you can do, or some sort of uh, my wife would call this a liturgy, but um, some sort of a a. Uh, a way in which you can normalize a 
you know, this is what we do over the dinner table. Like, you know, sometimes we have lots of things to share and sometimes we don't, but, you know, we're interested in, uh, you know, have it move from one, one person to the next person, right? And switch up who gets to ask the first question. But you, everyone gets to ask a question to someone, and that question, like you can kind of normalize or make liturgical a, because again, the, um, you know, uh, here's another here's another mother of uh, thing, right? Uh, Liter uh, Stratford Caldicott, but he says uh, liturgy ha inspires art, uh, and so the liturgical actually can, um, you know, the, the pattern by which we talk in this family can actually inspire things to go outside of the that pattern. So I think I think the and, and starting them at, with some sort of a uh, at a young age, like you know, getting them not just the answerers of your grilling as a parent, but participating in the asking of those questions to other people. Say, all right, all right, who wants to start today? Who's got a question for someone else? All right. um, and you have to model it. You say, all right, dad or mom, what was the most intriguing part of your day? All right. Uh, Simeon, what was the, when did you feel the most safe today, right? you know, whatever. Like, um, I think those types of questions where you can get it, it, it to, 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 to be a little more particular um, and a little more, um, not repetitive, but at least like structured can be, can be really helpful where it's not, you're not just kind of saying, how was your day, how was your day, how was your day? Like that's, there's, you're right, there's little for a student to grasp and there's easy out answers like, it was fine, it was good, yeah, they did okay. Yeah, stuff like that. So. You can ask your teacher to direct you to that. Yeah, that's good. Dinner table discussion starters. That's nice. Yeah, I would agree. I would agree. I think that's uh, um, uh, the. Uh, it's a good recommendation for teachers. Just if something happens during the day, uh, it, certainly if it's negative, you expect to hear from a teacher. Um, but we rarely hear from teachers with positive stuff, right? If something good happens in the class with a student. This kid, I asked this question today, and this kid said this. Like, that doesn't cost a teacher all that much of time. It costs them a little bit uh, to do that. But trying to trying to do that for a parent can be re really meaningful. It's a good thought. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Jordan. Sure. Thank you, guys.